Aloha, Merry Christmas to all of you out there. I don't know if that's politically correct to say Merry Christmas, but I'm a Christian and I'm gonna say Merry Christmas and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So I'd like to talk about the Grinch who stole Christmas. And here's what I mean by that, is that all of us live in associations and for whatever reason, we get some owner typically who disagrees with the board and we end up as an association spending large amounts of time and large amounts of money if we have to hire a lawyer to handle the most simple of disputes. Now, I would remind everybody that the fundamental concept of a condo associations is self-governance. So, you know, we as an association or you as an association are self-governed by an elected board of directors. And yes, there are 514B statutes that say what some of the things you have to do or not do. And certainly you have Robert's rules, which helps guide you to run a good meeting. But at the end of the day, most governing documents provide a great deal of authority to the board of directors to make decisions. So if the board of directors decides to do something that's lawful and you as an owner don't like that, you don't really have much standing other than to talk to your board and, and try to share your view. But what happens more times than not, they write demand letters and then they file a lawsuit and uh, your insurance premiums go up because this, the board's uh, insured uh, and protected by the director and officer liability policy. And you get into this endless discussion with the attorneys who are probably paying for their kids' education through this. And we get into this endless problem. And so the Grinch, that particular owner, stole Christmas because of the fact we're dealing with this. I was reading an article on the mainland, quite interestingly enough, that kind of leads into this, not totally applicable to Hawaii, but where a association on the mainland followed the bouncing ball, said, well, we have rules that says you can't put up Christmas decorations until Thanksgiving, and they have to be taken down by the first Saturday after New Year's. Okay. It's a rule, they, they wanna control what the aesthetics of the building looks like. So an owner in their wisdom says, okay, well, I hire someone to put my Christmas decorations up. I'm gonna put them up four days before Thanksgiving. But I'm not gonna turn the lights on until it's legally okay. So I'm positioning them to be turned on Thanksgiving, the legal day, and I'm putting them up theoretically early because I'm hanging them on the wall. And so what do you think the association promptly did? They sent them a demand letter and said, we're finding you $1,000 a day if you don't take down your pre-hung Christmas lights. Now, to me, there's a degree of common sense about this. The purpose and fundamental purpose of the rule is to have some control about what the uniformity of the project looks like. And, you know, people have solar panels up. They have other types of uh, house decorations up. And so someone's hung some lights around that aren't turned on. I doubt anybody notices them. But we get into these things. So they sued the owner and the owner hired a lawyer. And there's been no resolution by the courts in this matter yet. But it flunks the common sense test to me that, yes, we have rules, but you have to be able to position those rules to enforce them with some kind of common sense something logical to it. So here's what I'd like to tell you about Hawaii. <clears throat> First of all, there are several ways you can resolve a dispute with an owner. The easiest way is to ask for a meeting with the board of directors. You know, you can do that in an executive session. You can do that privately. You could do that in just a meeting outside of a regular board meeting of the committee of the whole. But if you don't, talk to the board and discuss this and see if you can find resolution and you just simply hire a lawyer to write letters, you are you seem to be already getting off on the wrong foot because you put the board in a defensive position. They'll be less likely to talk to you. And you have to ask yourself, is it fair to, when you have a concern not first talk to the board. I have another case I'm involved in right now. Uh, those of you may not know, I do a lot of expert witness work in the association industry. And it's a situation where the owner has taken a position contrary to the board. 
It hasn't been to a board meeting in a couple of years, hasn't ever asked the board why they, they believe their position is correct, and has simply started to write nasty newsletters to the owners and hired a lawyer. I'm not sure where that's productive for the association because argumentatively, uh, uh, if you have those nasty things, you have to disclose them when you buy and sell real estate. And it probably deters on the property value. I can't prove that, but it'd be logical to think if you have uh, baggage out there that uh, someone might want to pay less for the uh, property. So, but the first rule of thumb is in dispute resolution is number one, go to your board of directors. And number two, you have to respect what authority the board has within their governing documents because you can have your own logical ways why you think it should be different but if the elected board has the authority to do what they're doing you're not going to win this at the end of the day the board is going to be uh, the board has a right to be wrong if they made a business judgment a business decision and the, what they believe the best interest of the association there's no conflicts like they are they hired their brother to do something at some outrageous price. But you know, I don't see that too often. I'll get in towards the end of the show what we see are the common uh, claims made today by uh, owners against boards. So the first thing I just want to say at the outset is it's based on self-governance, these association. And boards have authority to find in their governing documents state law. And the best way, if you have an issue, is to talk to the board. On a personal note, my condo where I own in Kauai, um, the uh, front doors are all the same and they were uh, a metal door that's uh, kind of got a patina green uh, frame. Well, the board at some point in time got the owners, they all agreed to make it a, a brown frame. And so they, uh, different owners bought new doors with the brown frame and some owners could take their existing frame like me and have it painted brown so it still matches, you wouldn't know the difference. And so I frankly like my green door, but you live in a condo, you go with the rules of a condo, you go with the majority. So in January, my green door is being painted brown. It's just part of living in a condo. You have to make sacrifices and give up certain rights to make personal decisions when you live in a condo. That's just how it is. And, and it's logical why it's that way. <laughs> So let's just say you have that owner who doesn't want to listen to anything I just said, and you're going to have a dispute. You need to know that there are several methods in the current statute for condominiums, HRS 514B, that defines the different types of dispute resolution that are available to you. Let's begin with the first one, the oldest one on the books, not that popular, but it's still available and certainly on small claims uh, may have some uh, value uh, or in simple claims, I should say. And that is called facilitative mediation. A lot of people just say mediation, but you know, there's two types of mediation, facilitative and evaluative. We'll come back to that part in a minute. Facilitative mediation has a set of rules, just like everything has rules, I guess, these days. Um, and basically, the two sides agree to mediate the matter, and then the independent person is hired to try to get both sides to kumbaya and come together. Under the rules of facilitative mediation, the mediator can't take sides. He's not trying to say you're wrong, and he's just trying to express to each other neutrally both sides' point of view and see if you can find some common ground. And you have in Oahu, anyway, Mediation Center of the Pacific. There's, there's different ones on different islands where you, for a nominal fee to nonprofit, I'm going to say $100 a person, uh, go to the mediation and try to get a resolution voluntarily. The problem with that is if you decide you want to hire your own lawyer, you're going to have to pay for that on top of it. If the other side hires their own lawyer, they got to pay for it on top of it. And uh, um, the, the fundamental basis to it is you're going to, you're close enough, you should be able to find a way to make compromises to agree. And that has been around for a long time under Condo 514B. The problem with it in general is that if the two sides are entrenched in their position, it's unlikely you're going to be able to get both sides to find a compromise. And number two, you don't get a report that can be used, like who's right or wrong, 
it just ends with no no agreement and, and you go on and you've paid your 50 to 100 bucks a head in person and uh and moved on and yeah it works for some simple things i would i would say that um but for a lot of things uh, depending on the complexity it doesn't work remember i said there's two types of mediation there's facilitative and evaluative mediation evaluative mediation was introduced in the hawaii statutes two or three years ago i think it was act 187 when 196 uh, so my memory is failing uh, 196 basically said that as an additional option you can choose evaluative mediation now there's a distinct difference between facilitative and evaluative mediation in the case of evaluative mediation, you're picking again a neutral mediator. More times than not, it's done through one or two organizations and it's a retired judge. Under the rules of evaluative mediation, the mediator can take sides. It's almost like a settlement conference judge. And he can say, you know, if I was the judge in this case, I would make you pay all their legal fees. If I was a judge in this case, I'd rule against you. You know, the best you can do is getting this but not these other things. And so the, this, these, these are the most popular forms of mediation today because the judge who, normally they're judges, that doesn't have to be, but these people are kind of like a settlement conference judge. They'll take the gloves off and they'll tell each side exactly what they think of your case, looking for a way to get some form of compromise. A good example may be a deductible insurance claim who's responsible. Maybe there's a middle position that makes both sides happy and they can move on and and get things done. But uh, the big difference between facilitated and valid mediation is that the mediator takes a much stronger position. And what's interesting under the, as you may or may not know, condo associations pay into the real estate education trust fund. So there's money in there. Last time I looked, it's like two and a half million dollars where the way this works is that the first hour of the mediator's time, which is normally let's say less than $400, is paid half half by the two parties. So worse, you're at 175, 200 bucks to have this done by value to mediation. Then the balance of the mediation is paid to the real estate uh, education trust fund up to a ceiling of 6,000, I think it is. And then after that, the mediator can request additional funds if he feels that it is uh, something he's close to settling. So in this case, you get a much stronger mediator with a lot more authority that will advocate basically the law and the truth and, and what this is. And, and it's probably the most popular method today. Um, I, I did some statistics on that. And, you know, uh, about 75% of the cases resolved through this process. About 25% resolved in no resolution. But what was interesting is of those 25%, 100% resulted in no one filing suit. So someone's pride theoretically can say, well, I don't agree with you. I'm not going to admit that I was wrong. But then when you finish the mediation and the judges warned you about all the potential risk, you, know, you basically drop it and it goes away. So I think the uh, in my little brain, I say it's much more successful than 75% because it results in, I'm sure there must be cases that didn't result in litigation, but I just haven't seen them. And so that's a value to mediation. So that's the first two, the mediations, but we're at a point of a break time. And so we're gonna take a short one minute break and we'll be right back to talk about the other methods of resolving disputes among not only owners and board members, but board members themselves and management companies. So we'll be right back in a one minute. Aloha. I'm Christine Linders, physical therapist and board certified orthopedic clinical specialist. And I am the host of Movement Matters, a show that is designed to bring you the best physical therapy tips and exercises so that you can have your best 
body and do all the things that you love. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 11 a.m. on thinktechhawaii.com where I show you instructional videos from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes to get your body feeling its best. Remember, life is better when you listen to your physical therapist. I'll see you on Tuesday. Aloha and welcome back. And I'll say happy holidays for everybody else, those who didn't like Merry Christmas. And uh, we're in the show talking about dispute resolution and, and just briefly the first part of the show talked about self-governance is how condominiums are based. Number two, the well, first method to deal with a dispute is talk to your board. Next method is facilitative mediation, which is a kumbaya, try to get consensus. And the other mediation form is a value of mediation, which allows you to um, have a retired judge or someone more skillful take a much stronger position. You should understand under Act 196, some of the changes were made after it was adopted, was this is not just between an owner and the board. This can be between a board member and another board member. And this can be between the board and a management company, or maybe an owner and a management company. So they expanded the uh, number of parties that can participate in this program. Number two, when they amended the law subsequently, they also said, we'll pay for this if both sides voluntarily agree to make it binding arbitration. So you could very easily, uh, to avoid potential non-agreement, uh, voluntarily say, uh, let's make this binding arbitration. And then, in fact, the Real Estate Commission Education Trust Fund still pays for it, but you get uh, a firm resolution to the, uh, to the dispute. Now, what is a, another method of dispute resolution, which goes back pretty close to the original 514B being adopted? Very rarely used, and I'll explain why, but I've seen it used. And what it is is the right for board, the board to ask for non-binding arbitration. Now that seems to be a conflict in saying non-binding arbitration because basically under Hawaii law, arbitrations are binding and they're not appealable to the courts. Once you've gone into non-binding arbitration, you have an award, it's gonna take fraud or failure to disclose a conflict of interest, something fairly egregious to overturn an arbitration award. So what is non-binding arbitration? Well, it's a, it's a process that was developed before we had a value of mediation. And basically you go through the same process you would in an arbitration. Typically both sides hire a lawyer, you present your arguments, you examine witnesses, you present documents, and the arbitrator will issue an award. Now under Hawaii law, you can't force somebody into binding arbitration. They're entitled to a trial whether it be by judge or by jury, depending on the circumstances. And so it's non-binding because at the end of the day, either party can say, I'm filing for a trial de novo, which means that you want to set aside this non-binding verdict and you want to start all over again. But the statute poses some risks in doing that. If you do that, and in fact, you don't prevail on the next trial, for lack of a better word, by at least an improvement of your position by 10%. Then in fact, all those legal fees and costs since the trial of the Novo, excuse me, the, uh, since the non-binding arbitration award was issued, you'll have to reimburse the other side for those costs. And that's how I read it. So you have some risk if you get an award from a non-binding arbitration and you say, well, I was testing the waters. I don't want to comply with it. And usually this is before judges, again, retired judges. Then you run the risk that you may be responsible for some of the costs and legal fees to take it to the next level. If you don't position yourself in advance favor over what the truck what the arbitration award said. So, um, and that arbitration award is not admissible as evidence in the uh, in this uh, new trial, wherever that may be, or whatever 
right? It could be to say, you all agree to go to a new binding arbitration, or it could be you file a lawsuit and you hire lawyers and you mortgage your house to pay for the lawyers and, and your lawyers get a great education for their children. And meanwhile, you suffer because you have to cut your budget and you can't buy a new car. And meanwhile, you all hate each other. And, and then Christmas isn't any fun and the Grinch is still Christmas. My short scenario about that. But the fact is under the, under the statute, you have a right to a form of um, non-binding arbitration, mandatory, because I would tell you uh, for boards especially, you know, if you didn't go to this evaluative mediation and or the non-binding arbitration, it's considered under the statute, a breach of your fiduciary duty. And as such, your director and officer liability insurance may not cover you for that claim. So the stat, this legislature wants people to try to resolve these things. They want to try to keep them out of the court system. And I guess they're re basing that hope on common sense and people's wanting to resolve problems. But I can assure you the people out there who don't want to resolve problems, they want to get even for some reason. I don't know why. At the end of the day, it costs everybody the money and comes from the common pot. And so I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense. So what happens if you don't do facilitative mediation, you don't do evaluative mediation, and you don't do non-binding arbitration, which are by far the cheapest and fastest way to attempt to resolve a dispute? Then you can go to litigation and file a lawsuit. I had a lawsuit recently where the uh, owner filed a lawsuit on a matter. Then subsequent halfway into the lawsuit with discovery and deposition filed under the statute saying, I've changed my mind. I want nine binding arbitration. Well, the judge ruled, no, you, you that, that horse has left the barn. You know, you had that choice before you filed the lawsuit. You can't go backwards and say, uh, typically in trials and litigation anyway, they, the judge tries to force you into mediation. So why not start with mediation and hopefully avoid a lot of this cost and expense and consternation? And to me, I just drink more wine because I like wine. But the reality of it is, if you don't find a way to resolve these through the statute opportunities, facilitative mediation, evaluative mediation, non-binding arbitration, or just meeting with the board, your only really hopes are then is to file litigation or, or a lawsuit. And then you may voluntarily agree to put that in binding arbitration, but uh, the, the, you can't force a uh, party into binding arbitration. They have to, both sides have to voluntarily agree to it. And, you know, binding arbitration is pretty much like a court. You, uh, the arbitrator sets rules and deadlines and you produce documents and you, uh, bring witnesses before the arbitrator and they testify and you file documents and you write reports. It's probably no cheaper, it might be a little faster, it might be a little cheaper than doing it through the trial court system. But most people don't like the non-binding arbitration because there's no guarantee you're done. But some like the binding arbitration because the, the issues are quite simple and um, it, it's easy to get a solution much quicker. But then there may be a lot of other complicated issues that the board or the owner don't want to do binding arbitration. They want to have a trial judge and or jury um, rule on this matter. So that's kind of where uh, the rubber hits the road on, on your choices. Now, let me just tell you about what the most common disputes that are filed with the Real Estate Commission, as I said, you have this facilitative evaluative mediation uh, opportunity. And the Real Estate Commission, because of all these uh, firms and agencies that provide that service, have to get paid and they submit it to the Real Estate Commission. They keep a, statistics on, on these cases and the status, resolutions, non-resolutions, and, and, and those types of things. Well, let me tell you the most common things that I have seen as what are the common issues that we see before uh, the mediation process. Number one is insurance deductibles. Insurance deductibles, as you may know, a long time ago, 
uh, the law was changed to allow everybody uh, HO6 policies and, and force the deductible on the homeowner through the HO6. So in that particular case, they're arguing over who is responsible for the deductible. Some other unit may have been damaged, but you're the one that caused the damage. And the statute gives the board the right to make that decision. And there's the issues of when you have an assessment, maybe, whether it's a limited common element or common element, who's responsible to pay for it, Very to follow the governing documents. And uh, let me look at my notes here. And Barrier to produce documents is the statute is pretty clear that owners are entitled to certain documents, but they're not entitled to everything. They're entitled to be told by the board, we're not going to give you this because I'm required to. But uh, those are the basic issues. And the common sense test to me says, I don't know why we can't resolve those types of issues without filing a lawsuit. But I can tell you, having done a lot of this as an expert, um, it doesn't always work out that way. I would just encourage all of you and take a deep breath and realize that condominiums are based on self-governance and condo boards have rights to make decisions. And you may not like that decision, but you're going to be stuck with it. You know, you can certainly go out and try to fight to change the board. And I see all those problems too. But at the end of the day, you live in self-governance, but if you're not happy, remember, go to the board, facilitate a mediation, provide a mediation, non-binding arbitration, and if necessary, file a lawsuit. But I would tell you that's the most expensive, slowest way to go with the greatest risk. And on that note, as I said, the Grinch stole Christmas by following a suit against the Condo Association. And I'm going to say again, happy holidays to everybody. And thank you for watching Condo Insider. We hope to see you back next Thursday at 3 o'clock. We'll talk about another interesting topic in condos. And aloha and again, Merry Christmas.